Hi, and welcome to another episode of Living History, where we interview prominent coin dealers known throughout the numismatic industry. Today we speak with well-known Philadelphia dealer, Mr. Harry Foreman. Harry, thank you for being with us. Harry, how did you get started in the coin business? I didn't really get actively interested in coins professionally until about 1954. Not that I was a big collector, but like every 10-year-old kid, I bought coins back in 1932 from the late Jimmy Inarelli, who was a well-known Philadelphia coin dealer at the time. Why did you get into coins? Have you always been a dealer? Well, not really. I always had a latent interest in coins. And in 1953, during National Coin Week, I walked by a shop while they were putting a coin display in the window. And the owner of the store told me that the best investment I could buy at the time was 1954 proof sets because already last year's proof set, the 53, which cost $2.10, was selling for $6. It was a beautiful summer day, so I continued walking to the United States Minutes 16th and Spring Garden and bought 554 proof sets for two ten each, and the rest is history. Uh, I got married in 1954, in February of that year. In 1955, in January of 55, December of 55, my daughter Renee was born. And at the time, I was a little short, and I remembered I had the proof sets. And I went to the store of Catherine Bull and offered a couple of these proof sets for sale. Uh, incidentally, my associate Ruth Bauer was then behind Catherine Bull's counter. She had been employed by the late David Bullis since 1947. When Catherine paid me $3.10 a set, I stepped outside and says, my God, how long has this been going gone? 45% profit in only five months. I then proceeded to Larry's bookstore and bought all the books about coins that my limited capital, uh, uh, that I could afford. I came home and announced that to my wife that I was going to become a professional coin dealer. How did your wife react to you becoming a coin dealer? Well, she went along with it. She said, if that's what you want to do. She thought when she saw the books that I was getting ready to go to school, which at that time I was a high school graduate, would have been college. Uh, I never did go back to college, but uh, I had the satisfaction of uh, conducting a few courses at Adelphi University. I was on the uh, board of the Chicago University when they uh, had a, uh, a deal about coins. And ultimately, I got into my high school's Cultural Hall of Fame. I was their Cultural Hall of Fame winner in 1985 because of some of the things I had accomplished in coins. I had written a couple books. I had uh, published the Chuck O'Donnell book on paper money. Uh, I had sold the Tax A. Scott's comprehensive catalog of U.S. coins to Harmer Rook, who in turn sold it to Scott's. And I probably got a world record price of $75,000 for an unpublished uh, manuscript. That wasn't too bad, I thought, for a guy that had difficulty passing English. Wonder how I'd have made out if I'd have passed English. <laughs> Who were some of your teachers in coins? Who was instrumental in you learning about numismatics? Well, I realized there was very little that you could do. Once I had decided that coins was going to be my avocation or profession, that uh, books weren't enough. You had to meet the coin dealers because from them, you would get the knowledge. I sought out the most knowledgeable, and some were willing to depart with the information, some were not. Amongst those, my greatest teacher, I suppose, I've learned more from John J. Ford uh, than anyone else. Uh, John J. Ford, I know, was on the PN, member of PNG for a long while. He's alive, well, and semi-retired at this time. Uh, I would say the late Stephen Nagy was a good friend of mine. Nagy also 
I knew Nagy from about 56 to 1959. I often took him out for a drive to an auction in the country, and he reminisced, and I enjoyed it. Uh, I tried to get him to uh, uh, write a book about his reminiscences, and he wouldn't hear of it. And I suppose sooner or later people will come to me and ask me to do the same uh, thing. Uh, I've already, you know, given lectures where I reminisced about the past, uh, won uh, an award one year for uh, my reminiscences from the NLG, and uh, uh, there were many others. The late J.B. Stack, Morton Stack were very helpful, Arthur Kagan, uh, Henry Christensen. Uh, well, seems kind of funny to me today, like Jerry Cohen was an up-and-coming coin dealer when I started. Jerry's a good friend. Jerry was very uh, helpful. I could go on and on. I could mention people like Ben Levin, who is also still quite active today. Ben, incidentally, sold me a plate block Graf Zeppelin set, which so I think he charged me $400 for it. I think I traded it to John Ford for an 1856 Flying Eagle cent, and I sold the 1856 Flying Eagle cent to Jerry Cohn for $475 and thought I did tremendously well until some years later the Grav Zeppelin plate block set went up to I think $20,000 and uh, it was at one time the property of Werner Emily Meyer who as you know was the gentleman who uh, gave the ANA his 3,000 pounds of coins and stamps and I think they may find that plate block Grav Zeppelin set uh, in the collection. I've spoke to John Pittman, who has looked at some of the stuff. I spoke to John Ford, who knew Emily Meyer well. And uh, I kind of think there are a lot of surprises in store for the ANA when they start selling the uh, uh, Emily Meyer stuff in the near future. I myself sold Emily Meyer some bags of silver dollars with the understanding that John Ford wasn't to know about it. What was it like at some of the early coin conventions? Well, the first ANA convention I attended was in 1956. Prior to that, I think the first major convention that I ever attended was the Grand, the uh, Metropolitan New York Convention in 1956 in New York City. I mentioned to you earlier that the first coins that I really sold to uh, Catherine Bull took place in January 1955. By the next year or so, I bought and sold coins to learn the business. I knew that with the uh, knowledge, the money would eventually come, and I had to gain the knowledge. Uh, the first real coin show I went to was in 1956, where for the first time I met Arthur Kagan, I met Jerry Cohen, I met Foxy Steinberg, you know, I met uh, John Ford. And I realized that getting to know these people would help me in uh, learning the coin business. By 1956, I decided to go to the ANA convention in Chicago. I went with a friend of mine who uh, owned a 1956 catalog, Cadillac at the time, Harry Heaps and Bernie Gimmelson. Uh, we drove for 18 consecutive hours from Philadelphia to Chicago. It was kind of exciting. It was really the first time, well, it wasn't the first time I had been away from home, but on a business venture, it was really the first time I had been away. I'd heard about Chicago. Chicago, you know, was really a, a town, you know, like New York, let's say. Um, I met Ray Yablin, who was then a big time coin dealer, walked in with a suitcase full of proof sets and sold the entire contents of the suitcase to Ray Yablin. In the store at the time, he introduced me to Johnny Rowe, who was later to become a good friend, and told me at the time that Johnny Rowe, at the age of 18, was already a big time coin dealer. Johnny had worked for Shermerhorn and had sold the Shermerhorn collection of rare paper money, and 
uh, we became thick, you know, in later years. Johnny Rowe and I are still good friends today. I also met for the first time at that Chicago convention, Naaman Carter Jr. Bernie Gimmelson pointed him out to me and said, if you got a man like that as your customer, you would be set. The man is a multimillionaire. And of course, I had never met any multimillionaires or known any up until that time. And strange as it may sound, Eamon Carter, Carter walked right up to me and said, Mr. <coughs> Foreman, I'd like you to do me a favor. And I was kind of puzzled as to why does he want me to do him a favor. He says, in the next room is a man by the name of Mitula. He has an 1885 proof nickel for which he's asking me $75. It's not worth that. Will you see if you can buy it for me for less? And I says, gee, this guy certainly is stingy with his money. He's worried about the price of an 1885 proof nickel. How much less than $75 is the coin worth? I went to see Mr. Matua and I said, Mr. Matua, how much is that 1885 proof nickel? And he says, is it for Carter? And I said, who's Carter? And he said, oh, he's some rich Texan. He says, he wants that coin. So the cheap guy won't give me $75, but if you want it for 55 you can have it. I reached in my pocket, gave him $55, took the coin, put it in my case. A little while later, Eamon Carter came by, saw the coin in my case, said, oh, I see you got it. How much did it cost you? I says, $55. He says, how much do you want? And I said, $55. He said, don't you want any profit? I said, didn't you ask me to do you a favor? And we both laughed about it, and it was the beginning of a long friendship. I sold Eamon many coins after that, and I admired Eamon, and I guess Eamon admired me also, because he had a favorite nickname for me, one of my prized possessions to this day, is a book that was written about his father called Eamon. It was a limited edition. He probably had one of the reporters on the Fort Worth Star Telegram, which he owned, write it. And he inscribed it to my favorite big time spender. And that's the nickname he had for me, you know, big time spender, because he knew that I knew how many millions he was worth when I say he was worth in the hundreds of million. Mm -hmm. And yet when we went out socially, we went out to have dinner, we would always fight for the check, you know. And another story, if you want to hear another Raymond Carter story, I guess we finished the one uh, with the nickel. I was in Washington, D.C. one day when they were releasing the silver dollars. And this was before hardly anybody knew that they were giving out silver dollars in Washington. What had happened is some man had written in his newsletter that bags of silver dollars, mint sealed, could be gotten from a gotten from an honest dealer in Philadelphia by the name of Harry Foreman. And we started to get checks for ten fifty a bag from all over the country because he also listed our address. So every day Ruth and I used to fly to Washington from Philadelphia. It was in those days, I think, a twenty dollar excursion. And uh, we had a car parked in Washington at the airport. We had all the labels made up and we'd go to the Treasury, get the bags of silver dollars, take them to Railway Express was then in business, deliver them, leave the car at the airport and go on home. This went on for about a week before anybody found out what was going on. On one of the last days, uh, they started giving out Morgan dollars. Now Morgan dollars were much more profitable than the peace dollars we were getting up at that time because I remember selling 30 bags of Morgan dollars I got one day to Jules Steinman of Pasadena, California at $1,200 a bag. That was $6,000 and that was better than the uh, $3,000 that we were making on the peace dollars. And uh, uh, we got these uh, bag of dollars. We used to have the money wired into Riggs National Bank in uh, Washington, D.C. and Eldridge Jones, who was a well-known coin collector, was the manager of the bank, and we'd have no trouble getting the cash and walking across the street. It was kind of scary walking across the street with 50,000 cash in the pocket at the time. So I used to tell the traffic cop standing on our corner, this is right in Washington where Riggs Bank and the Treasury is, watch me as I go across the street because I got a large amount of cash in my pocket. And every time as I walked by him, I used to flip him a silver dollar. It was just a fun remember it, and it was kind of a fun thing. But I had bumped an Eamon caught in the airport, and I said, Eamon, 
what are you doing here? And he says, oh, he says, I came to see my friend LBJ. And I knew he wasn't kidding because I knew that Eamon uh, was quite up there in politics. He was a newspaper uh, owner uh, from Texas. And uh, I said, they're giving out bags of Morgans at the Treasury. Give me a couple million dollars and I'll get you, you know, a couple hundred bags. Now let me tell you one other story to deviate for a minute. This is the part that really fascinated me about Eamon Carter. I once went to an auction with Eamon, where Eamon was in attendance, and me, Eamon, Johnny Rowe, and my stockbroker went to dinner. And he asked the stockbroker what he did for a living, and the stockbroker said he was a stockbroker. Then he says, oh, I guess this will interest you, and he reached into his briefcase and took out a stock certificate for, I think, 450,000 shares of gold foil. Now, gold foil at the time, I think, was about $31 a share. That stock certificate was worth about $15 million, you know. It belonged probably to the Carter Foundation. And he said, watch my briefcase, you know, while I go to the John. And the guy, you know, that I was with said, who the hell is that guy? And I said, oh, he's a friend of mine, Eamon Carter Jr. Said, oh, my God, he says, I, you know, I've heard of him. You know, I couldn't believe it. Now, I remember one trade when I was getting silver dollars in Philadelphia at the bank. I was getting used dollars, and there were many Carson City dollars in these bank. And I was telling Eamon I was finding CCs and I was finding 93 S's, but I really didn't have the time to look through them. And Eamon said, gee, I'd like to get some of them bags. And we made a swap. I got a roll set of dimes, and maybe I sent him three bags of these unlooked through silver dollars. And I was sitting home one night about 11 o'clock at night, and he said, Harry, you're not going to believe this. I went through those silver dollars, and I found three 1893S Morgan dollars, you know. And I said to myself, I can't believe this. Gold foil went up about two bucks a share today. That stock certificate is worth 900000 more than it was yesterday. And he's calling me to tell me he found three 93S dollars, which are then worth $30 a piece. But that was Eamon Carter, you know, the... The thrill is in the search, in the hunt. And uh, he enjoyed coins and was quite a collector, quite a dealer too. He dealt, you know, he had a table at every a and convention and he was as sharp as the sharpest. You know, he knew paper money like nobody else. And uh, he knew his coins too. And foreign paper money, everybody acknowledged him to be the expert. The fact that his foreign paper money collection just sold to Christensen for $3 million is proof of that. How did the BU roll market get started? Well, let's go back a little before that. You mentioned something about the stacks earlier, and I don't really want to forget the stacks because all the stacks in my time have been very good friends of mine. The fathers, J.B., Morton, the sons, Harvey, Ben, Norman, well, Larry, you know, the grandson of Hardly know Larry compared to the older ones, but the fathers really, you know, taught me the business. And one of the things I remember the most, uh, in 1957 or 8, I liked 1895 proof Morgan dollars. They were only selling at about 57. If you look in a book someplace, they, I kind of remember them at around $150 a piece. And like I said, I liked them, so it was not unusual for me to have two, three, four of them in stock at one time. In 1957, I guess that was the year, 50D nickels uh, were selling at about $25 a roll. Now, Frank Spadone, who's still alive and well, has a little coin shop on the way to Atlantic City on a white horse pike, and is the author of that great selling book, the Spadone era book, had a bag of 50D nickels. I found out from one of my real mentors in Philadelphia, a guy who really taught me the business, who most people don't know or don't never heard of, but John Ford would know him, the Stack Boys would know him, Charlie Dacus. Charlie Dacus was a man who really, he was a vest pocket, he was a dealer's dealer, but he was a vest pocket dealer, he never advertised, he just used to make up packages and send them to Abe Kossoff and send them to, to uh, McDermott, you know, who was then a big time dealer, and uh, I bought some of the rarest of the rare coins that exist from Charlie Dacus, because Charlie Dacus had the connections. He had been around. 
uh, since the 30s. So Charlie Dockers called me up one day and asked me, do you want to buy a bag of 50D nickels? And I says, well, how much? He says, well, I can give it to you for $1,500. So I bought the bag of nickels, and we had to go out to Spadone's house, who then lived in Newark, New Jersey, to get the bag for $1,500. I don't know what he paid Spadone, but, you know, I was just the, the, the wheels. Dockers never drove, never had a car. Uh, I advertised that bag in scrapbook for $27 a roll and got inundated with orders. You know, they were moving, they were rising because a year or so earlier, I remember buying my first 50D nickel roll for $6. And here it was a year, a year and a half later with 27. You know, mm -hmm. the roll market was moving. So I decided that the rolls were cheap. Now, the biggest roll dealer of all time, and at that time, was Max Hershorn. Max Hershorn owned a tea company, a big tea company. He was one of the biggest independent tea packers in the world. As a matter of fact, he was one of only two tea bag manufactured machinery. They had 28 machinists working building the, the machinery for tea bag manufacture. His brother, as a matter of fact, made the first tea bag. And for 17 years, they had a patent on a tea bag until their lawyers screwed them, according to Max. And then you had other people started making tea packaging machinery. But Max, in any event, was a multimillionaire when I knew him. And I still know him. Max is still alive and well. I think he's about, oh, he's in his late 80s, about 88, 89. And uh, his son, Steve, is a member of the PNG, Steve uh, Hershorn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met Max uh, through unusual circumstances. There was a banker in um, Pittsburgh who had a roll collection of early rolls. And he wrote me a letter, and I made him a bid. Now, I didn't know that Hershorn was also bidding. And one day, Max Hershorn called me up and said, listen, sonny boy, you and I are having an auction over these rolls. And believe me, I got more money than you got. Now, do you want to split this collection, or do you want to fight it out with me? I said, Mr. Hershorn, I know you got more money than I. I don't want to fight with you. I said, I'll go partners with you on a collection. He says, OK. I says, but? you have to send me the money. I says, you know, I, don't, I can't lay the money out. I don't have that much money. He says, boy, some coin dealer you are, you don't even have the money. So I went to Pittsburgh, bought this collection with these early rolls from uh, this fellow. I think his name was Lee Mason. And uh, my deal with her, Sean, is after I bought the stuff, I would drive to New York, meet him in New York, and we'd whack it up 50-50. And if there was anything additionally that I got. Now, I know this is going to sound strange to you, but I got 11928 peace dollars, BU, from Mr. Mason for $2 a piece. And they were only worth about $7 a piece at the time. So I got to New York. I says, uh, Mr. Hirschman, here are all your rolls. He says, you get anything additionally? I says, yes, I got 128 peace dollars uh, at uh, $2 a piece. And I have 50 of them there for you. He says, you can keep them. I'm not interested in uh, silver dollars. I said, but Mr. Hirschhorn, they're worth seven dollars a piece. He says, you're a very honest boy, but you can have them because silver dollars don't mean anything to me. That was my first meeting with Max Hirschhorn. We later became very dear friends, and you know, I kind of feel remiss that I haven't seen him now in about a year or two, and I keep promising the son that I'm going to get out there and see him in the very near future. Uh, Max had an inventory in BU rolls of a million dollars face. I mention this because I told you he was a multimillionaire to begin with. When he sold his tea business, I think Coca-Cola bought it. I know it probably was in excess of $10 million uh, at the time, but Max was always a wealthy man, according to Max, you know. And he's a very, you know, he collected coins for a while. I think Stack sold his collection in 1950. To show you how long ago he collected coins. Mm -hmm. But he played around with rolls up until the uh, 70s, I guess, you know, when he finally uh, sold his business and retired. I guess today just collects checks and goes to the track, you know, lives a life of uh, leisure. Uh, his son, the only son, Steve, is a coin dealer in. Uh, 
San Diego, I think he calls himself the Silver Dollar Guild or whatever. I hear from Steve every once in a while. And uh, I guess they go into New York. A couple of years ago, Steve came in from California. So he basically taught me the roll business. The prices were cheap. The market was on the move. And I find it unbelievable that the roll market is as dead. It's worse than that now than when I started with rolls in 1956. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there might be some stuff that's still selling for less. You know, it's kind of frustrating because I know I'm going to tell you a story you're not going to believe. 55 as dimes are not rare, they're not scarce, they're not worth anything, but the market is so busy with 400 dealers here in Long Beach, I need one roll to fill an order and I can't find one roll. I don't believe it. I know I'll go on the tape and I can buy 100 rolls, but God, you can't believe that the roll market is so dead. And of course I say, God, what a perfect time to write another book because everything goes in cycles Right. And when they should be buying, when stuff is going for nothing, nobody wants them, nobody is. And that's normal in any hobby, in any field, in any investment. You know, who's it that said, buy when everybody's selling and sell when everybody's buying? Please don't spread the word around, David. <laughs> <laughs> and what caused that BU roll market to take off in the 1950s and 60s? Well, I think it was more or less the poor man's stock market. Um... Uh, they bought the rolls, they went up, they could sell them. You could buy rolls, like I remember one gentleman must have bought 27 bags of 55 S cents when they were $1.75 a roll. And I remember buying the 27 bags from him and giving him $27 a roll. That's a phenomenal increase. And then I talked him into taking all that money he was getting and buying small date cents at $100 a roll. He bought small date cents at $100 a roll, and later I begged him to sell them to me when they were $400 a roll. I think at that level he may have sold me a couple bags of them. Ultimately, the bulk of the money went, he was very much interested in charity, and they went to a Mennonite uh, school for boys. Uh, you know, his man's name is Howard Histon. And Howard Histon spoke to him a couple weeks ago. He's now 83 years of age. But all that money, you know, uh, uh, went to charity, you know. But I'm saying, look at that. He bought 55 S cents for $1.75. He sold them for $27. He took the money and bought small dates at 100 and then sold them at 400 You know, it's just like playing the stock market, you know. But you need limited capital. I think the same things exist today that existed then, the same opportunities, you know, if you know where to go, uh, 55 as dimes at current retail levels are ridiculous, like $37 a roll. Smart guy if I was your age, and even at my age I'm thinking of putting some away because in a few years I can't not see where they're not going to go up 50%, mm -hmm. you know, go to $50 a roll. Any boom in the silver price will trigger it, and we know that silver's volatile, it won't stand mm -hmm. still. It'll go up and down, and I've seen silver go from 90 to $1.20, from $1.20, I saw it go from 6 to 6, I saw it go from 50 to 50, I saw it go back to 10, from 10, I saw it go back to 24, from 24, I saw it go back to 485, from 485, I saw it go back to 1480, from 1480, I saw it go back to 480, from 480, I saw it go back to 11 and a quarter recently. So if it doubles six or seven times and all that thing I just gave you, why won't it double again from the current price of 612? Just a question of time. When? But it'll get there. Did you do business with a known commemorative dealer, Jonah Shapiro? Jonah was very nice to me, treated me very nice. He never forgot. I got all the small dates I wanted from Jonah. And I like to tell the story that it, here at Long Beach in 1963, I came to this convention with an attache case full of coins. Well, in those days, we dealt a lot more in rare coins because they were much cheaper than they are than we do today. And I had figured out that my inventory was probably cost about $40,000, dollars $45,000. But I had a lot of impaired gold proofs and a lot of impaired silver proofs. I had some commemorative gold sets and only 
airplane while while in the way to time. I was a five and a half hour flight to Long Beach, and I think I had a direct flight. I remember Duffy was the chairman of that coin show. There wasn't the Long Beach coin show yet as we know it. That came later. And I started putting the coins out in my case. I had three cases. And the crowd gathered because I had plenty of goodies. Foxy Steinberg was waiting to buy stuff. Jerry Cohen was waiting to buy stuff. And I said, I will not sell anybody any material until all the coins are in my case. And Joe Shapiro walked up to see what was doing. Why, there was a crowd around me. And he looked in and he said, Harry, how much will you take for everything? And I said, $50,000. And he reached out. He said, sold. Give me all the cases. And he took the three cases, piled them one on top of the other. And I remember watching that the proofs were rolling around. And Foxy Steinberg said to me, is he serious? And I said, he better be. And Jonah walked away. A little later, Jonah says, well, let's talk. You want some small date cents? I says, yeah, I'll take five bags. And Jonah shook his hand and says, you got it. A little while later, he shipped me five bags of small date cents. Now, I sold two bags for $10,000 a bag, and I hocked, when I hocked, I pawned three bags in Provident Loan Society for $10,000 a bag and had my $50,000. But I had three bags of cents mm -hmm. on loan at Provident Loan Society. The guy at the time was a man that's still around by the name of George Smith, Jr., George Smith, one of the finest gentlemen I've ever met in my time. And George had more faith in me than any banker I know. George gave me the $30,000 because I assured him that I would not hang Provident. No matter what happened, I would take out those bags of small date cents. When they got the 400 a roll, I too started selling mine. <laughs> and I made a big, big score because, you know, Naturally, I drove the price down from 400 maybe to 300 but I was selling them all the way down. And of course, you know, that uh, was kind of exciting because it gave me plenty of uh, working capital, and then I took the money and went out and bought more rolls and created a, another roll boom and something else, you know. And uh, it's kind of amazing to see interest lost because, you know, a few years ago, not too long ago, 38D Buffalo Nichols were selling for... 1800 a roll. I just sold a few rolls last week for $800 a roll. They're down $1,000. And I don't think that's inflation. I think they'll come back. They're a good type. They're a good roll. They come beautiful. And I think in time, every item has its course. Today is the age of the holders. You know, the MS65s and the MS66s and commemorative halves. Speaking about commemorative halves, in 1963, we had a convention in Philadelphia, and Gina was formed. Now, the leading force behind Gina was Sal Kaplan. And Sal Kaplan, we used to call him behind his back, the little dictator. You know, all little guys seem to have that Napoleonic complex. And Sal Kaplan says, you're the vice president of Gina. I said, Sal, I don't want to be the vice president. I don't want no title. He says, you're it. There's no point in arguing with Sal, so I was the first founding Vice President of Gina. The boss chairman at the first convention was my associate, Ruth Bauer. When the convention is over, Sal Kaplan invited me up to his room and says, I got something for you. And he opened up a case and he took out 500 Cleveland and 500 Merlins and 500 Robinsons and 500 Roanokes. Altogether was 2,500 different commems. And he says, here's an invoice. I says, you want me to sign it? He says, why? Are you going to beat me? He says, when you sell them, send me a check. And I had a devil of a time selling those uh, commemoratives. Uh, I remember Bob Batchelder got a big portion of them, and nobody wanted them. You know, commems had their ups and downs. You know, I can't believe that they're bringing some of the numbers they're bringing today, but they really deserve to be where they're at today. Mm -hmm. And I think many of them are underpriced. I think that some of the XFAU Colombian halves are selling for twelve, fifteen dollars in the coin trade today. Probably in a few years, be selling for twenty-five dollars. You know, and uh, it's the first commem, and like I find them harder and harder to buy in the lower grades, and they're impossible in the unks. You know, mm -hmm. believe it or not, I used to buy 
rolls of uncertain Columbia and a half dollars from the late Ed Rice. And Ed Rice, we, you asked me earlier who was some of the numismatists that taught you. Ed Rice was one of the first numismatists. Now Ed Rice, poor soul passed on, was a very good friend of mine. He was a very good friend of Ruth. Ruth knew him from the time she was 17 years old. It was kind of a fun thing because Ed Rice used to call and I used to say, your friend's on the phone. And if she was mad at him, she'd say, it's your friend, you know. Ed Rice was the funniest guy I ever met. When it came to business, he would hassle you for a quarter, a half a dollar. When he met you outside of business, when he met you socially, you couldn't pick up the check. He was one of the biggest sports I know. Ed Rice lived exactly the midway point between New York and Philadelphia. And I traveled to New York quite frequently in the early days. And on the way back, invariably, I would stop at Ed Rice's home in Cranberry. Always did a lot of business with Ed. But the truth of the matter is he made me a wonderful sandwich. You know, he had that Polish ham. Please, you know, this is confidential, ain't it? I'm the, I'm, I'm the president of a synagogue, and if they found out I ate Polish ham, it wouldn't look too good. <laughs> but Ed made a delicious sandwich, and it's the only chance I ever had to eat Polish ham. And I used to get the biggest kick because back in 1973, we made a silver bar of the crucifix. And I bought that crucifix from Ed Rice. Like Ed Rice had a little antique shop that was open part time. And one day I walked in and I was looking for a good crucifix. Of course, Ruth and I had decided that the 73 Madison Men Art Bar was going to have the crucifix on it. And Ed had a beautiful crucifix that I, in silver that I recognized that belonged to a priest. And I said, Ed, how much is that crucifix? And he said, what's a nice Jewish boy? want a crucifix for I says, I got a Catholic friend I want to give it to. He says, well, it's price $15. I'll give it to you for 11 I said, I'll take it. And we used that to make that 73 Madison Mint art bar. Uh, back in 1972, when I reached my 50th birthday, the staff of Harry J. Foreman surprised me and made an art bar with my profile on it. Uh, it's now listed in the new Art Bar book, you know. There was only 50 of them made each for, you know, one year of my birthday. And Ruth gave them out. They belonged to Ruth. And uh, uh, Ed Rice had one. I used to get a big kick at going to Ed Rice. There was Jesus Christ on the wall. And right underneath Jesus Christ was Harry Foreman. The two Art Bars that he had hanging up in his... Uh, in his home. But he was a great guy and he was a great numismatist. Uh, his name will be mentioned very shortly in a forthcoming book about assay metals. Most people don't know this, but at one time I owned the largest collection of assay metals that had ever been assembled by any living American. At one time I probably owned, I believe it was 248 different assay metals. In the early days, I started buying assay metals because I recognized them for what they were. I had read old catalogs where they sold at auction in the 20s for $20, $30 a piece. And here in 1956, 57, they were selling for $5 a piece. Well, John Ford approached me and asked me if I wanted to buy the brand collection of assay metals. There was about 120 assay metals, and I bought the brand collection. Then a little later, Max Schwartz, the late Max Schwartz, who uh, at one time was the executive secretary of the PNG, uh, also sold me his collection of maybe 90 medals. Chuck Krause at one time sold me 15 different. He started to collect them at one time. And I'd accumulated close to 250 medals. And Ed Rice had a big collection of about 210 medals. And Ed Rice always used to hassle me and say, why don't you sell me your assay medals? One day, I think it was about 1972, I said to Ruth, I'd like to get a new car, I'd like to get a new Cadillac, and Ruth said, we can't afford it. I said, God, they only sell for $7,200. She says, we don't have the money. So Ed Rice called me up and as usual, why don't you sell me your assay medals? And I said, why don't you sell me yours? He says, I'll tell you what, we'll hold an auction. Either you buy mine or I'll buy yours. I says, that sounds good. I says, go ahead. He says, you start. I says, no, you start. He says, $45 a piece. I says, you just bought 250 of them. 
And just then, Ruth walked in my office and said, what did you sell? I says, my assay metals. She said, why did you do that? I said, I need the money for a new Cadillac. She says, you're right. So that night, Ruth and I delivered the 250 medals to assay metal. He was just like a little baby on the floor. And Ed Rice now, I had the biggest collection up until that time, but Ed Rice now accumulated on 480 assay medals, had the biggest thing. There were patterns, you know, it was, mm -hmm. the, it, it's surprising when you stop to consider that and probably in no year was more than 20 made, you know, up until the uh, 60s. For one man to own 480 was almost an impossibility. Uh, a new book has just is coming out on assay metals, and uh, the guy just sent me some copy last week. He wants me, to, Julian, is doing the book, and asked me to go through some parts to make sure, like the information that I supplied, uh, was correct. But uh, it was kind of you know a fun thing accumulating them, putting together. Uh, it's like even now telling you that at one time I had 250 of the assay medals. Uh, that's the way I became friendly with Frank Gasparro. In 1959, during National Coin Week, I asked the director of the Mint for permission to exhibit my assay medals at the Mint. And here I was putting them on display, and this uh, little guy kept poking over my shoulder, poking me over his shoulder, finally he turned around and he says, excuse me, mind if I ask you a question? Where did you get all those medals? I says, I'm a coin dealer, I bought them. He says, it's fascinating that a private individual owns all these medals. They should be in a museum. And I says, well, someday I hope they will be. But Frank and I developed a friendship from that time on. Uh, I still see Frank maybe once a month that we meet, have dinner, you know, discuss various things. I just uh, had a chance to get him a big job at Gorham Jewelry. Uh, Gorham is doing a plate which has some silver trim on it, and they wanted him to hand engrave the silver trim, and uh, he studied it. The representative from Gorham came down, and uh, he said, you know, Harry, he says, it'll take me two hours to do each plate, and they're only offering me $45 a plate. That's $22.5 an hour. He says, I can't work for that kind of money. He says, it's too much pressure. How did the 1960 small date penny market take off? What was happening with that? Oh, uh, I'll tell you how it came about, because it was one of the biggest things, like you said. Uh, we were big already in the roll business, bag business. And Bernie Gimmelson called me up and said, I've got 60p cents. Do you want to buy 50 bags? And I bought 50 bags of 60p cents from Bernie Gimmelson for $60 a bag. I advertised them for $79.50 and sold out, went to people all over the country. Uh, a little while after that, I was approached by someone and said, hey, do you want to buy a roll of small date cents? And I said, you're crazy. And uh, the guy says, well, here, I've got one roll of each. Take a look. There's a difference. And I looked at him, and I was flabbergasted because with the naked eye, you could tell the large date and the small date. I said, what do you want for him? He says, well, I'll take five bucks a roll. So I gave him five dollars, you know, and 50 cents for the two rolls, and I went to a convention. Another name that I should mention that was very helpful to me in the early days. I guess I should mention Mike Coleman Jr. and uh, Art uh, Jim Kelly. I used to go to a coin show and we knew that whatever I took to a coin show I could sell out with the three K's. That was Kagan, Kelly, and Coleman. And uh, I showed the two roles to uh, Jim Kelly who founded Paramount Coin later on. And Jim says, what do you want for these two rolls? And I said, 50 bucks. And Jim says, sure, I'll take them, because Jim recognized a, a new variety. I didn't realize at the time that I had sold 50 bags of pennies that were small date cents. So now I started to advertise to buy these small date cents, just like I'm advertising right now to buy the 82 no FGs. And all the people that I sold them to says, hey, Harry, 
I got a bag I'll sell you. And I don't remember I was paying 5000 6000 8000 10000 They just kept going up and up, you know, every day, you know. And new people came in, and Coin World had just started at that time, and it was headlines, you know, and it was like a treasure hunt. Everybody was, you know, looking. Now, where Jonah Shapiro came into the act is somewhere in a bank. There was 100 bags of small date cents. And they were offered to me, but the guy wanted cash, and I didn't want to get involved, you know. I said, if I can't buy them, and I told Joan about the deal, and I told Joan how to handle it. I said, if you're afraid of cash, trade the guy coins, you know, get coins, give him coins, tell him the coins are the same as cash. But Joan had some problems with the deal that I didn't really, in other words, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, I like to sleep nights. I don't want anything that is shady in any respect, any form. I've been reviewed by an IRS more than once. It's cost me a fortune and, you know, to have a good lawyer representing me. But at the same time, I've always looked this IRS agent square in the eye because I got nothing to hide or nothing to be ashamed of. Now, that's the way I live and that's the way I taught my children to live. And, you know, in the Bible, it says we're not rated and they're rafted by the amounts of gold and silver we leave behind, but we're rated by our reputation, so I've got a pretty good one and I've worked hard to preserve it. And that's what happened with the small date sense. That was the beginning. It fed on its own publicity. Prices, you know, don't go up. Prices in any market are caused by supply and demand. Like I told someone today, right now, I might be in Coin World this week paying 180 for you know, 82, no FG, but if you approached me privately and say, hey, I got 10 rolls, I would give you 280, because in the paper, you don't jump from 180 to 280, you can't do that. I'll go 200 next week, maybe 200, two and a quarter, maybe 250, and by the time I get into the paper paying 300, maybe I'll really be paying 400, you know? But that's what you call, like you say, you're a market maker, that's being a market maker. Uh, one thing, and we're getting close to the end here, I realize that, is I'll touch on another subject that you would probably ask me about anyway, is the 1981 set of Chinese coins, the Bronze Age Discovery Set. Of all the, bronze, the China coins today, this is one of the highest priced and one of the most priced Chinese coin sets. Now, I mentioned to you I've been in on that thing very, from the very beginning. The thing came out in 1981. It represented the material that was dug up by the Chinese in the ancient Forbidden City in about 1979. They got around the strike and the commemorative. On the coins are portrayed some of the objects that were uncovered. The rhinoceros, the elephant, the dragon, the winged dragon, and the leopard. These all represent statues that were uncovered along with 6,000 soldiers. When they came out, the price of gold was $720 an ounce in 1981. AMARC was the exclusive distributor. It was to be a limited mintage of 25,000 sets. They sold exactly 1,000 sets to, to AMARC. The price of gold collapsed. It went all the way from 720 down to its low at 285. At 285, AMARC was hung with some sets. Uh, they broke up a couple hundred sets. Somebody must have walked in there and bought 200 dragons from them. And uh, a few years went by, and one day Murray Singer said to Steve Markov, there's one guy in the business that can you know, bail you out, and that's Harry Foreman. If you want me to, I'll go to Harry Foreman. So Steve says, you're right, go to Harry Foreman. So Murray called me up and said, look, we got 100 sets, you know, we'll take $1,400 a set. I think it was 1450 I went to a friend of mine who was a pretty sharp telemarketer, told him the deal, said, hey, these are good, only 1,000 sets. He said, yeah, we'll take them, you know, gave me 50 bucks a piece. It's a pretty good score, you know, 100 times 50 is $5,000. Then Murray says, well, we got, you know, so many 200 halves and 200 this and 200 that. And then I started selling the individual. For almost a year, I ran an ad between 675 and 750 on the one ounce elephant. And I used to say to Ruth, I can't wait to sell out because once I sell out, I'm going to put these things up to 1,500 
and make everybody that didn't buy them eat their heart out because they didn't buy them. Believe me, it was a hard sell. To make a long story short, eventually we sold out. I started buying them. Today I'm paying $17.50 for the elephant. I am a current buyer of the set in the neighborhood of $6,000. And the set is one of the hottest items around. What makes it so good is the disappearance of the 200 dragons. Nobody knows where they're at. Murray Singer said they were sold retail. It's impossible because I've had ads in the paper. I will right now pay $2,750, $2,750 for a winged dragon, 1981 China. And I buy sets, and I can break the sets up. I can sell the dragon, then I can sell the other 300 of coins. I sell the box, and no matter how many sets I buy, I've got enough customers because there are 200 people out there with three-piece sets that are missing the dragon. So uh, I, honestly, I would tell you, if you were on FNN, on the Financial News Network, to buy the leopard because to me it don't make sense. The dragon is 3,500, and the leopard is 600, and they both have the same image. Something's wrong. The leopard's too cheap. Any one last question? Go ahead. Harry, when it's all said and done, how do you want to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered? By the way I am. You know, I don't really want to be uh, remembered other than what I am. Uh, it's kind of fun uh, to think back, to know the way you are, and know you will be uh, remembered that way, if at all you are remembered. You know, Max Schwartz, when he sold me his assay metal collection, says, I'm selling these to you. But if you ever write a book about assay metals, I want to be remembered. And I mentioned that to uh, Julian. I said, you know, when I bought the guy, I promised him that if a book was written, that he would be, you know, in the book. And I guess that, uh, you know, in time to come, uh, when we all go to our final coin show, I guess you would say, uh, uh, Really, I mean, I don't want to be remembered other than what I uh, actually did. I love the coin business. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to me when I became a coin dealer. And I don't really care so much about the coins because I'll tell you the truth. The camaraderie of the people that you meet in the coin profession is even more meaningful than either even the money you make or the, you know, the travel. I've been all over the world, as you're well aware. I've been to Japan, I've been to Hong Kong, you know, I've been all over the United States. And it's real great when you have enough expertise to say, I want to go to Long Beach and figure out a way to make it worth your while. Now, to be honest with you, I am well aware, uh, Carl Bernstein once told me a long time ago, if you ever want to go to Long Beach, just give me a call and I'll see to it that you should have a table. But I'll tell you, one of the most flattering things at this coin show was the fact that San Lopresto put me at table number one. I really did it. He bent over backwards, and I don't see any reason. Like I said to Ruth, I guarantee you that uh, Trader Sam must have put in a word for us because Trader Sam, no matter where he's at, I think still has a hidden interest in Long Beach, and he must have said to Sam, if Harry ever asked for anything, give it to him. Because, you know, I was one of the guys that helped uh, Sam and Ray in the beginning when they started this show. And the fact, you know, that an Eastern coin deal was coming out to the West Coast, you know, was a big thing at that time. Today, there's more guys from Philadelphia here than there are in Philadelphia. But uh, it's kind of a coin, uh, you know, a fun thing. And it's interesting, you know, to pick up the financial news network, to see some of the stuff that you're doing to see some of the companies like uh, uh, Panda American, Blanchard get sold to big corporations. I suspect that more of it will take place. The last time I was approached by a big company, I took the letter and threw it in the wastebasket. The letter read, we are a you know, big company representing a company that does in excess of $500 million a year. We're interested in buying your coin company and Ruth and I took a look at it, laughed, tore it up, threw it in the wastebasket, never answered it. And I'd lay 100 to 1, that letter was from General Mills. Of course, how many companies, you know, could do 
a half a million a year. Um, the Panamanian government approached me about a deal with the Panamanian stuff before they went to Paramount. But I'll be honest with you, uh, I've always been kind of lazy and I've always looked for the easy road. You know, I don't really want to overwork myself when I have to work. You know, I do work. But, you know, headaches at this point, what do I need it? I got a pension coming up soon. I've got a company pension. I'll be eligible, uh, you know, for Social Security. But I promise you I won't retire because what would I do? <laughs> as long as I'm able, I'll be around. My guest today has been Mr. Harry Foreman, well-known Philadelphia coin dealer. This has been another episode of Living History.